All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our second day of covering sunflower topics here for our webinar series. Um, I appreciate all of you taking time out of your morning to be here with us today. Uh, just a quick reminder, we will have a short poll that will pop up at the end of our talk today. Um, please take a minute or two to fill it out, just be a couple questions, um, and we will also uh, pull up a CCA credit and that will be available after the speaker today is finished. Um, we will be having one speaker today. That is Dr. Adam Barenhorst. Uh, he is a, an assistant professor and field crop entomology extension specialist here at SDSU, uh, where he oversees research related to the management of insects in South Dakota's major agricultural crops. And Dr. Barenhorst's overall goal is the development of IPM programs that are economically sustainable for South Dakota producers. Um, and today, Dr. Varenhorst will be talking about red sunflower seed weevils, um, and his title is Red Sunflower Seed Weevils, There is a Problem in South Dakota. So with that, Adam, you are welcome to begin your talk. All right, well, thanks for the introduction, Shelby, and uh, thank you all for hopping on to attend today. And I, it says red sunflower seed weevils. I'll talk about a few other sunflower pests as well. So it's not just exclusive, but uh, to the red sunflower seed weevils, but they are a bigger problem right now as far as insect pests and sunflowers go. And so let's go ahead and get started. But I also want to talk about uh, the work we're doing with red sunflower seed weevils isn't exclusive to South Dakota. We're collaborating with North Dakota State University. And so we've been working with Janet Canodal in her lab, as well as some of the other researchers out in North Dakota. They've been collecting data from there as well. And we're comparing the two populations that we're sampling. And then at South Dakota State, my grad student, Aaron Hargens, has been working on this project for the last three years. Uh, he started before he was even a grad student. And then he's hopefully going to be finishing up here pretty soon. And then Philip Roseboom and Patrick Wagner have also been helping with this project. And uh, as you can see, a lot of people. Uh, and there's a reason it's a lot of a lot of drive time and a lot of work to collect all these weevils. So why why do we worry about red sunflower seed weevils so much? Well, they're an annual pest of sunflower. They're native to the U.S. and they can have really large populations. If you grow sunflowers, you know that you're spraying at least once a year for these and sometimes twice, uh, just depending on the infestations. And if you have a really severe infestation, which is not uncommon, you can lose about 50 to 80% of the echinis, so the developing seeds, they can be infested. And the real kicker that I think with these pests is they're not even eating the entire developing seed, uh, which that doesn't necessarily make it better, but at least it would seem like they really needed it. Uh, but instead they feed on a partial amount of that seed. So a lot of times they'll eat half or so, uh, and then they'll drop out into the soil at the end of the season. And so they kind of are a wasteful insect, which that's just, if you've seen them out in the field, they're pretty small. So it makes sense. The larvae can't eat a ton, but uh, you can imagine even if you don't lose the full seed, you're losing seed weight if you have these in the field. And uh, they're a major issue for confection sunflowers because if they feed on the seed and that seed goes and gets uh, roasted, uh, it then has a kind of a distinct and bad flavor to it. So Red sunflower seed weevils are primarily managed in South Dakota using foliar insecticides. There has been some work, uh, I don't think it's made it extremely far, looking at using maybe some host plant resistance traits. However, those are still being worked on and developed and trying to really pinpoint what makes uh, this plant kind of resistant to this pest. And one of the issues is what might make it resistant be a thicker seed coat, which might have some issues down the road uh, for other traits that we might not be looking for. So uh, hopefully we keep seeing work being done in that area. And so I said, it's an annual pest. And looking back through the older literature, it's not uncommon to see really large outbreaks of red sunflower seed weevils. Uh, the threshold we recommend is somewhere between four to six weevils per head. Uh, if you want to be really precise each year, you need to calculate that out based on the price of the sunflower and then the cost of the insecticide application. But we've kind of in South Dakota gone with that four to six. It's typically somewhere in between there anyway. And that gives us a good place to kind of keep on track for uh, when we're out there scouting. 
But in South Dakota, for the last few years, we've been seeing really routine outbreaks that are 10 to 100 times over the threshold. So if you think about that, we're seeing on, on a single head uh, somewhere between 40 and 600 uh, weevils. And in some fields, I think we're seeing more, but uh, especially as you can see in this picture, sometimes they're kind of hard to count. And even when we take the deed out and spray it and so they are forced out of the head, we have some trouble counting them all. They're moving around a lot. So a uh, lot of weevils though, that's the, that's the key here is that there are just a lot of weevils out in the fields. And that's bad enough because you have to get out there and manage them. But now we're also for the last few years receiving field failure reports. So people are going out, they're having the field sprayed. And then they, when they go out and rescout, they're noticing that there's still a lot of weevils out there. And so that was kind of an alarming uh, report when we first received it. We tried to go out and take a look at things. And that's kind of what really started all of the research that we're doing right now is that first report. And so here's a picture I just, uh, Phil took this a few years ago. We had an efficacy trial uh, at Dakota Lakes. And so as you can see here, these are all dead. And there were a lot of them. But if we look really close, and this is, you know, on the, the back of the head, there's still a few here crawling around, happy as can be. And so, you know, that's not our evidence that there might be a problem, but it was kind of the start of, yeah, there's something going on here and we need to investigate this a little bit further. So we have large populations and we have some not dying. And so one of the questions that we kept receiving was, well, it really, is it really maybe a susceptibility to the insecticide issue or is it maybe more of an issue of there's so many weevils on those heads? And as you know, it's sometimes it's hard to get insecticide coverage at really optimal levels. Uh, for a sunflower head, because depending on the time of day, uh, they're typically facing one direction. As the season progresses, they start to tip the head down. Uh, hopefully, we're not spraying at that point. We want to spray when it's still facing up anyway for the growth stages we're targeting, but uh, it can just make it difficult. And so we, we wanted to investigate that a little further. And so if, as we dug, we started to think, well, maybe there could be some reason there'd be a problem because if you look at our South Dakota Pest Management Guides for Alfalfa and Oil Seeds, it has all the sunflower insecticides that you can use, and we list them out and say which can be used for red sunflower seed weevils. And as I was digging through that, it seems like we have a ton of insecticides, 47 different products labeled for red sunflower seed weevil management. But it, the story gets kind of interesting as we start going a little deeper because we see that 29 of those different products have a pyrethroid active ingredient. And those aren't all the same active ingredient, but there's a lot of them that are very, uh, very much the same as in they are all Lambda Cyhelithrin is a large chunk. And then there's some others like Zeta Zypermethrin, Esfenvalerate, uh, just to name a few. But then if we look, there's at least five products that have at least one pyrethroid active ingredient. And then there's 13 with just one organophosphate active ingredient. So these are the pre-mixed uh, products. But when we dig a little deeper, we see that actually, uh, you know, looking at what the EPA just put out, we're going to be in a little bit of trouble for 2022 because chlorpyrifos is no longer going to be able to be used for sunflower production. Uh, there was the revoke, they revoke the tolerances, the food tolerances for that product. And all of our organophosphates that were labeled for red sunflower seed weevil management and sunflower had the active ingredient chlorpyrifos. So now we're going to be looking at those 29 pyrethroid active ingredients that are labeled. And the majority of those are lambda cyhalothrin. Well, I'm guessing you guys can see where this is going. What product are we having the biggest issues with, with these failure reports? Lambda cyhalothrin. And so that's where we're kind of at. From 2017, so every year since the first report, we've received a report. This isn't just us going out. We've received reports of field failures in South Dakota for lambda cyhalothrin. Actually, this year we had a report for us and Valerie. So that, that's where it's starting to get really scary as researchers and trying to figure out how to manage this pest. 
because if it's just the one active ingredient, that's bad enough. But now that we're looking at maybe two active ingredients, we're getting into kind of a realm of what are we going to do? And so I've already mentioned it, but populations have been so far above threshold. So there still is a little bit of a pushback uh, that we're seeing and people are still not sure if there's really maybe something going on with the chemicals or if it's more of the populations. And I have this term down here, reduced susceptibility. So typically when we talk about an insect overcoming an insecticide, we call that resistance. Well, why aren't we calling it resistance here? Well, we can't. And the reason for that is we don't have a susceptible population of red sunflower seed weevils. Nobody's been keeping these in a lab for the last 20 years. And so we don't have a population from South Dakota that's 100% susceptible. And so what we can say though, is that we observe reduced susceptibility. So the chemicals aren't having the same impact that we would expect on the populations. And so that's kind of the entomologist way of getting around not having that population that you would compare the field population to, is we, we kind of estimate where we should be and compare that to where we are. Now for this project, we had seven treatments. Now the acetone, uh, that was used as the untreated control. When you're mixing these insecticides and putting them in these little vials that we use, you have to have something that helps uh, them dry a little bit more rapidly. And so that's what the acetone is for. So we mix them with the acetone. And then the vials after they're treated are actually, they're put on a hot dog roller with the heat turned off and they just spin. And that ensures that we get a really good even coat of the insecticide inside that vial. And it also, you don't have the lid on, so it helps that product dry a little bit faster. Or I guess you do have the lid on. You don't want it spilling, but it helps. The whole thing is you want it to be evenly distributed within the vial so the weevils can't all huddle up in one little area uh, and be free of the insecticide, but it also uh, helps things dry a little bit faster because we don't want to put the weevils into a vial where we have liquid insect the insecticide solution down at the base because of course that's going to be very concentrated and if they don't drown uh, they will be exposed to more than what they normally would be and so we used high and low rates for lambda cyhalothrin esfen valerate and zeta zypromethrin so uh, to go through here the most common products for the lambda cyhalothrin would be warrior 2 lambda cy Lambda Psi Ag, there's so many different generic products for Lambda Psi Halothrin. Esfen Valerate would be Asana XL, and Zeta Zypromethrin would be Mustang and Mustang Max. So for the red sunflower seed weevils, we collected all of the adults right at the onset of flowering. So that our, uh, and some of them were a little earlier. Uh, one of the things we have to do when we're collecting these weevils, is we have to beat the planes. And so we actually went out around our uh, late R3, early R4 this year to make sure we were collecting weevils before they got sprayed. And also to make sure that we weren't out in a field that had just been sprayed. But we collected from 24 different locations. So 24 different fields in South Dakota and 10 different fields in North Dakota. You can, uh, Phil, Aaron and I were on the road a lot this year uh, because we're stationed out of Brookings and uh, you guys know that Brookings doesn't grow a lot of sunflowers, and that's also not where the problem's been reported from. So we were driving uh, towards Pier and around Pier, uh, and Patrick handled west of uh, the Missouri River Forest for collections. But a lot of locations this year in South Dakota. We did in the past, we've done fewer adults. This year, we bumped it up a little bit. The reason for that is the vials are big, the weevils are small. And we felt we could comfortably put 20 adults in and we had no problems with that. So we actually put 20 adult weevils into the vials. We had to wait 24 hours after we collected them though, because you collect them from the field and they essentially will go through kind of a shock phase because you're taking them out of the field, you grab them off the heads and you need to let them rest for a little bit because there will be some just natural death uh, from that just transportation and all of those events. So uh, we try to make sure we're pulling live adults and putting them in the vials. So that's why we wait 24 hours. And then we wait another 24 hours after we put them in the vials and we count how many are still alive and how many are dead. And I say we grab them from the heads and it, it dawned on me that a lot of people probably don't know how we do that. The weevils are small and we're putting 20 per vial and that means we need thousands 
and thousands of these weevils. Well, we use these aspirators and here's a picture of the aspirator. So this is your collection end right here. So, and this is where the weevils go down into. And we have to put this in our mouth. So we try to keep this end really clean, but you inhale and that creates a vacuum, which then if the weevil, this is up close to the weevil, it sucks the weevil down. There's a little screen right here that keeps us from inhaling the weevils. Uh, sometimes that screen gets really clogged up when you're working with sunflowers, we found out. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, you can, uh, if you know what a sunflower plant smells like, well, by the end of the day, we know what it tastes like uh, from just all of that work. And uh, Phil and I found out that when you are collecting thousands of weevils, you do, after a while, uh, you, you get kind of congested because we think you're also draw, drawing in a lot of pollen. So we're hoping to figure out something else. This is kind of the old method. We'll have to see if we can't figure out something else because sunflowers are kind of a bear to work with, uh, especially when they're just starting to put pollen out. So for the rates of the insecticides, our high, high rate or normal rate for lambda cyhelithrin was 1.92 fluid ounces per acre. Esmondal rate was 9.6 and zeta zypermethrin was four fluid ounces per acre. For the low the lambda cyhalothrin was 0.96, esfandelar is 5.8, and zeta zypermethrin was 2.6. Now, these are on the labels. So these are the labeled rates. So this is the high end of the labeled rate. This is the low end. And I'm going to break this out, but I combined all of our 2021 South Dakota locations uh, for this graph because I think it really shows us what the trend is. Over here on the y-axis, we have our corrected mortality plus or minus the standard error. The mean, that's the standard error. The mean are these bars here. And that's just the variation we had within our different vials. Now, the corrected mortality is a little bit trickier. You'll notice we don't have that untreated control bar. And the reason for that is the untreated control represents what our optimal survival would be in those vials. And so if we have a few weevils dying, we can estimate that Maybe the vials aren't a perfect environment for the weevils. And so we can correct the death that we saw in the untreated control and normalize the rest of the data to whatever died in the control. So that's what the corrected mortality means here. And then these little asterisks up here indicate that this treatment, the average for this was significantly different from one. And that means that we were below 100%, significantly lower than 100% mortality. We want to be up here. That means we killed all the weevils. So if we look for all of our treatments and the rates, when we combine all of the locations, we see that it doesn't matter high or low rate or what product. We saw that every treatment was significantly lower than one. And so that indicates to us that we actually probably were seeing some reduced susceptibility to the products that we tested in 2021. So now we're going to look at a few locations and I did uh, pick out some of them that look the worst. We do still have some locations as you head west, uh, Sturges area, especially we have our research farm there uh, now outside of Sturges by the airport. We collected weevils there. We didn't see any indication of resistance. However, we look at our first location here, which was east of Harold on Highway 14, we saw issues for lambda cyhalothrin at both the high and low rates. Although the high rate was pretty close, it was still significantly different from one, the estimate value rate, low rate. But this is what we're starting to see more with the estimate value rate. Although not significantly different from one, our bar is starting to drop down from where it was two years ago and even from last year. And then for the zeta uh, the trend that we see here in South Dakota for most locations is Zeta zypermethrin doesn't work well for red sunflower seed weevils. And so we saw issues for both the high and the low rates. The variation of these bars is so high because you'll notice we're pretty low here for our average mortality, kind of around the 40, 50% range, kind of, I think, closer to the 40% range for mortality. We had a lot of survival, but in some of those vials, we had higher survival than others. So some were maybe, uh, two dead with 18 surviving and maybe somewhere at 10. And that's why we get this higher variation in the standard error. So these uh, little lines here, 
if you look here, these are all smaller, and that's because everything was pretty consistent uh, in those treatments. So now we're going to look at our next location, which was south of Blount on 310th Street. So this is off Canning Road. And for our mortality for Lambda Psi Health, and we saw that both the high and the low rates were significantly different from one. So Lambda Psi Health, and again, not looking great for us here in South Dakota. The S and Valerie, again, the high rate wasn't significantly different from one, but you'll notice we're dropping. The low rate was significantly different from one. And then Zeta Zypermethrin, again, both the high and the low were significantly different from one. And the low, you'll notice, is really low, uh, low mortality. And so uh, we'll talk about that more later, but just kind of keep in mind the trends that we're seeing here. We want these bars higher and we're seeing them going lower in many of our locations because we test pretty close uh, in the same neighborhoods essentially every year. And so we'll have to do a comparison on that down the road. But uh, the next location is north of Dakota Lakes Farm, the research farm on Canning Road. Uh, and so what we saw was both for the high and the low Lambda Psi Health and significantly different from one. The S and Valerie was just the low rate that was significantly from different from one. And then both the high and the low Zeta Zypermethrin were significantly different from one. So now this is our worst location that we looked at this year. Uh, this is around two miles north of, of Highway 12 on uh, Highway, or I guess, I gotta, I've got to look what I typed here. Uh, north of Highway 12 near 83. So uh, you can kind of guess it was close to the, the crossroads there, the, that corner. And so uh, what we saw here is that really none of the treatments looked very good. So both the Lambda high and low were significantly different from one, but this is the lowest we saw. Uh, so we were below 50%. The low had a lot of variation, uh, but overall looked pretty poor. <clears throat> and so what we see here then, when we look at the S and Valerate, both significantly different from one. And this happens to be in the area uh, where we had our field failure report for S and Valerate. And so uh, this is really the first time we've seen this big of an issue with S and Valerate. And then for, if we look at the Zeta Zypermethrin, both the high and the low were significantly different from one. So uh, in this field, you know, looking at it in this neighborhood, uh, you can make out, I need to correct that slide. It looks like it's a little confusing, but <clears throat> one of the things that we can take away from here is that we need to look at something different for management in this area. Uh, what we're doing right now probably isn't working very well and probably will work worse in the future, especially if everybody in the area keeps treating with these same products, uh, because these are our common one. We know everybody's using uh, typically Lambda Sahelhern, Esfen Valerie, or maybe a tank mix with Lambda Sahelhern, and historically Chlorpyrifos. And so uh, we, we need to think about what we're going to do moving here into the future. So let's summarize the results from the 2020 versus 2021. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice, it sounds like. So for reduced susceptibility, remember, reduced susceptibility means that we have populations that aren't responding to the insecticide seed treat or insecticide treatments. For lambda cyhalothrin in 2020, so all of these numbers, the first numbers here represent 2020 and the second ones represent 2021. So for Lambda Say Halothrin, in 2020, we saw two of the 12 fields we tested having a reduced susceptibility issue. So those bars were significantly different from one. In 2021, we had 17 of our 24 locations where there was a difference, significant difference for Lambda Say Halothrin from 100%. <clears throat> for S. Valerie, and 2020, we saw two of 12. So you can see Lambda Psi Health and S and Valerate were pretty similar. However, the magnitude uh, for these was a little bit different in terms of when those we looked at the response of those bars. If we look at S and Valerate for 2021, 11 of our 24 locations had evidence of reduced susceptibility. And then for Zeta Zypermethrin, now Zeta Zypermethrin. Uh, isn't typically used for red sunflower seed weevil management. We threw it in because it, it's a pretty good product for a lot of different pests. We are curious. 
you know, we don't hear a lot of people using it. There might be a reason. Uh, even back in 2020, we saw seven of our 12 locations that wasn't working very well. We jumped to this uh, last year, 2021, 20 of 24 locations had an issue. Uh, you know, and I mean, we're talking about, we could have probably hit 24 uh, pretty easily. Uh, you know, it just was right on the line. And so uh, in another year or two, I wouldn't be surprised if almost 100%. in 2020 had an issue with land site health and 71% in 2021. So as some Valerate, 25% in 2020, 46% in 2021. And Zeta Zypermethrin went from 70 or 67 percent, sorry, in 2020 to 83 percent in 2021. So what's the trend here? The trend is the problem is getting worse, and so we would ideally see these numbers stay the same or go down. They're going up, and we more than doubled for Lambda Cyhalothrin in terms of the issues. Now we also tested more, so kind of get into that area of, well, you tested more fields, of course, you're going to see more of an issue. Well, if we tested more fields, we probably spread over a larger geographic area. And ideally that would have actually driven our numbers down because hopefully this isn't spread out throughout the entire state. However, in reality, we still saw an increase. And so I think that, and just from some of the anecdotal conversations, uh, the evidence that I've had from conversations with growers is that they're noticing more of an issue. And I think we're going to continue to see this issue if we continue relying solely on pyrethroid active ingredients. So why might we be seeing this increase across the board? I mean, people aren't even using zeta zypermethrin. Well, there's this term called cross resistance. And it happens when you use products that have active ingredients that are in the same class. And so if you have products in the same class, they have similar modes of action. So the overall mode of action is listed as the same, but maybe each one targets something a little bit differently uh, in that, that mechanism. But if you have everything that's pretty similar and you're noticing this trend, there's probably a pretty good indication that some cross resistance is occurring. That's something we're going to have to look at uh, as we go forward and actually test for that. But I think the evidence of a potential issue with that is here especially for the zeta zypermethrin. And so as we move forward, we are planning on evaluating additional locations in 2022. I didn't have the map up today, but we are pretty spread out. We still are pretty concentrated though on uh, Highway 14 going up 83 to 212. You know, that's kind of our hot spot for in terms of sunflower production. We also, though, went out west a little more. As we move forward in 2022, we want to really start spreading out even more because what we want to do is eventually develop a map where we can kind of determine where these hot spots are. So if we have reduced susceptibility, can we actually pinpoint, you know, where's the focal point of that? Where's, where's it the worst? And then figure out where it spreads out from so we can put management recommendations in place. And so we also have a few other things we want to look at. One of the things that's really interesting uh, for us here in South Dakota is when we look at the North Dakota sites, they had no signs of reduced susceptibility again. So for the last two years, they don't have any indication that there's a problem. And you might be thinking, well, what the heck? Uh, you know, we're not very far apart where sunflowers are grown in South Dakota versus North Dakota aren't very far apart. But when we are sampling this year, uh, we went we started, uh, turned off Highway 14 onto 83, and we just headed north. And so we kept going off onto gravels and some county roads and sampled. But we also just kept going back to 83 and heading north. And one of the things from when I started a few years ago here, I guess it's been uh, seven years ago now, uh, SDSU. So it's been a while. Uh, one of the things I noticed was kind of a shocking thing for me. Uh, as we traveled, because we didn't travel much last year due to the pandemic, is just kind of the reduction in sunflower production as you get really close to the border uh, for North Dakota. And so we might, uh, Jan Canodal and I are going to look into this a little bit more, but we might have kind of a barrier between us 
uh, where we just don't have a lot of sunflower production occurring. And we also need to find out how far these weevils actually fly. We know they fly, but we don't know how far they fly after emergence in search of those sunflower fields. So the larvae drop out of the, the uh, sunflower heads after they feed on the seeds in the fall, drop into the soil and they overwinter there. In the spring, they emerge out of that field. So where we had our sunflowers last year, and then they have to seek out this year's sunflower. One of the things that we haven't been able to find, it's not in the literature, nobody's looked at this, is how far can one of those weevils fly? Because if it's five miles, well, then we know that it's more of a neighborhood effect. And maybe we essentially start seeing a little bit of a leapfrog as they move from one field, maybe they spread out and uh, that might be what's going on. But if they can fly a longer distance, uh, then it's really uh, going to be interesting why we aren't seeing sun, any issues really up in North Dakota. So something we will be looking at. And so, you know, as we continue going forward, why might there be some reduced susceptibility issues? Well, I mentioned it already, coverage in sunflowers can be pretty difficult. Uh, you're, you're flying these on pretty much uh, all the time is you're using aerial application. And I'm not saying anything against our aerial applicators. It's just tough to get insecticide in general when you're flying uh, because, you know, those insects just aren't on the top of the plant. These weevils actually kind of burrow. They don't feed into the head, but they push themselves as tight to the, through the achenes as they can, those developing flowers, developing seeds. So they kind of get down in there so the females can lay their eggs. We also have these really large populations of red sunflower seed weevil. Now, you know, looking in the past, what's the number one recommendation if you have a problem with any pest that overwinters in the soil? Tillage. Well, I'm not going to be the guy that recommends we till up a lot of these fields that have been in long-term no-till. Uh, I don't know. I should check if Dwayne or Ruth are on. I don't want to get yelled at. Uh, but, you know, there's been a push for a good reason. I see Ruth is on. So Ruth, don't yell at me, please. Uh, but there's been this push where we have this long-term no-till, and that's great for our soil conservation. But I think we need to start thinking about how we can use alternative means to manage these pests besides tillage and also not rely solely on insecticides. And so that's something we're going to have to really start diving into, especially when we have issues like we're seeing for the red sunflower seed weevils. And uh, the other thing is, is this routine treatment for red sunflower seed weevils. And also uh, kind of our tendency when a product works and it's the most economical treatment, we tend to rely on that product. And so I think we've had kind of a heavy, heavy reliance and it's not anybody's fault because we just also don't have a lot of treatments available in sunflower. We have a lot of different products, but when you start, as I showed you guys, as you start digging in, we don't have a lot of variation or diversity in those active ingredients or classes. And so we're kind of, kind of shoved against the wall on that one in terms of, well, I have a problem with Lambda Sahelithrin. Well, what can I switch to? And right now we don't have very many options. Whoops. And so uh, that brings us up to the next slide. And I think that this image here really uh, shows where we're at as we move into 2022. So the uh, mountain, I think is what it is, rock anyway over on this side is our red sunflower seed weevil reduce susceptibility to pyrethroids. And over here on the other side is uh, another rock. That's the EPA decision on chlorpyrifos residues and the revoking of those uh, residue tolerances. And then right here in the middle where we're stuck between a rock and a hard place is managing red sunflower seed wheels. And I think we could put just about any pest in there right now because we're kind of going to be caught uh, right now because managing some of these pests, we did rely on chlorpyrifos as an active ingredient, as an alternative to our pyrethroids. Uh, maybe it wasn't the greatest system. The fact that we only had two that we really switched back and forth between, but chlorpyrifos was a hard hitting product and yeah, it wasn't safe, but it reduced those pest populations when we needed it to. However, I should note that a few years ago when we did include chlorpyrifos in our trial for our vial assays, uh, there was some evidence that it was even having some issues with red sunflower seed weevils. And so I don't have those that data for you today, but 
you know, as we go forward, I think there's going to be some issues in terms of what's available and what we can use. And just to kind of dive into this chlorpyrifos thing a little bit further. So the EPA made a final rule back in August 2021 uh, on the food tolerances for chlorpyrifos. And they decided that chlorpyrifos is dangerous and it shouldn't be allowed to have any food tolerances. So they revoked those. And, you know, at first there was a lot of confusion because uh, when they initially put the notice out, there wasn't a lot of information regarding, you know, when you say food tolerances, is this for, you know, production lines uh, in terms of, you know, factories where food is produced? Well, they released some additional information about a month or two after the uh, August uh, release. And they said they gave kind of a broad, anything that's related that can be tied into the food chain. So pretty much any of our ag-based production can be tied into the food chain for humans. Now the rule became effective on October 29th, 2021. The tolerances formally expire February 28th. So just a little over a month from right now. And so uh, in the past, when we see a product, if a, you know, a product gets revoked or the EPA decides that there needs to be more evidence in terms of safety, we see uh, the EPA announce that you can use existing stocks in the product. However, for chlorpyrifos, they put a notice out that that does not apply to this decision. So even if you have chlorpyrifos available, don't use it in 2022. From what I've read, there's going to be uh, uh, there's going to be potential testing of seed. And so if you treated with chlorpyrifos, I have to make sure I get this right. So if you treated with chlorpyrifos in 2021 and you still are storing that seed, you need to make sure you have documentation to prove that that seed was grown in 2021 and treated in 2021. So you need your spray records. If you have seed that's produced in 2022 and you try to treat it with chlorpyrifos and market it, there is the potential that you could be spot checked. If you are spot checked and it was treated in 2022, it will be destroyed. If it was treated in 2021 and you get spot checked and you can provide evidence, it can still be accepted. And so that's where it gets kind of interesting. Uh, it'll be really interesting to see how this is, these inspections are implemented. But my best advice that I can give everyone is don't use your chlorpyrifos in 2022. And I'm guessing that uh, there's going to the next uh, container recycling and chemical recy uh, recycling effort by the state, you're probably going to see a lot of chlorpyrifos present. Uh, you know, it, it's unfortunate, but that's probably where we're going to be at for this. Um, I'm looking here, I have a few questions on this. And since we're on this topic, uh, I see Ruth asked, uh, will you be able to use Laura's band for sunflowers slated for the bird seed market? Now that, that you might be able to Ruth, uh, the big catch is if it's going, if at any point that could potentially enter, uh, you know, the human food chain, then no. Uh, if it's already contracted for bird seed, I would guess that you'd be allowed to do that yet. Uh, I, I need to look that one up and get back, get back to you on that. But yeah, uh, there's still a lot of unknowns. And I think, I think there's a lot of things that need to be clarified yet before uh, February 28th. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's coming up really quick. And I'll answer the rest of the questions here. Uh, once, once I wrap this up, so I'll leave a few minutes to answer everyone's questions. So back to our rock in a hard place and being caught in the in between, uh, one of the things that we're going to be doing, we've already been talking North Dakota and South Dakota. We've been talking, we're going to be throwing some different products that are currently unlabeled for sunflower into our trials. The reason for that is there are other products that are used for managing weevils and other crops. They should be similar enough uh, 
target sites in those weevil populations is what we would maybe be targeting in our red sunflower seed weevils. So we want to test those, see if they work. And I think something else we're probably going to be seeing at least for this year is we're probably going to need to have some emergency registrations uh, for alternative products. Uh, so we'll keep you updated on all of that. But, you know, we can't, I can't give you guys all this evidence that there's a problem and then say, well, good luck. Can't say that. So I'm, I mean, we are going to work and try to make sure that there's some alternative options available because, you know, right now there's just not a lot. So take a second. I'd like to thank National Sunflower Association as well as the South Dakota Oil Seeds Council for supporting us for the last few years uh, in looking into this problem. Uh, they've been very helpful. And so we'll continue working with them. And we, we have plans to do a lot more work on this pest and try to get things under control for it. Now, a few more pests I wanna talk about in the last few minutes before I answer some questions. I had a lot of questions this fall about Decti stem borer, sometimes referred to as the longhorn stem borer, um, but we call it Decti's most of the time. The adults are these gray beetles with really long antenna. So if you ever see these, uh, they have really long antenna. You can put, if they have them folded up behind their back, it's long, almost twice as long as their body. Uh, I've seen these uh, in the spring, so in June sometimes on volunteer sunflower. Uh, I haven't actually ever seen one in the sunflower fields. Probably it's just a timing issue. Uh, the larvae are what we care about though, because they're what are actually in the plant. They're cream colored, they're legless, kind of have an accordion shaped body, and they have this dark brown head. And they can be about a third to a half an inch long. And they'll be down in the pith feeding their way through. So they, they bore in the stalk. And once we reach the end of the season, they go down to the base of the stalk and then they feed around the edge. Uh, so I cut this one off, but imagine that it fed. So they actually can, uh, they kind of position themselves here and then they feed out and they go in a circle and they girdle the stalk. And the whole idea there is they want that stalk to break during the winter and the spring so that they can emerge as adults. And so they overwinter, they make kind of a home down below that point where they fed and they overwinter there. So the injury from this pest is actually from the girdling. So there's been historic projects that have looked into this. I didn't do them. They were done uh, for the most part in North Dakota. I think Kansas did some, but all the evidence shows that even if you have one of these guys in the stock, their feeding isn't really reducing yield. And I should also mention Almost 100% of the time, you'll only find one of these per plant. And the reason for that is they're cannibalistic and territorial as larvae. They don't want to share their food source. And so they eat each other if there are more than one laid in the plant. Uh, so what can we do? Well, if we think about, I said they girdle. So they imagine this is the center of the stalk where they kind of were feeding down through the pith. They kind of position themselves and then they push outward as they're feeding. And then they just keep doing that all the way around. And so it takes them a while, I'm sure. I've never actually, I don't know if anybody's ever timed how long that process actually takes. Uh, but if you have plants with a stock diameter that's less, or sorry, stock radius that's less than a half inch, they can easily from the center feed out and feed around. Because I said these guys are about a half an inch long at max. So you can imagine when we have radiuses of the stock, that are greater than half an inch, these guys can't really effectively feed around it. And so one of the best things we can recommend is lower plant populations. So uh, reduce your seeding rate a little bit, get larger stems and the decti stem bore becomes less of an issue. However, uh, you know, if we look at last year, it was pretty dry. Dry conditions can cause slender stems, which means that you'll have lodging. When you have a higher planting population, you have slender stems to begin with, plus dry conditions means that you're going to have earlier lodging. And a couple of years ago, uh, Ruth sent me some pictures where they were actually uh, Dectes, and I had Jan confirm because, you know, I'd never had heard of it and she hadn't either. They were actually Dectes up at the top of the head. And so I'm not sure if that's because the plants were stressed enough due to drought that they actually went up in search of resources, but 
uh, whatever the case was there. Uh, the big issue, though, is the girdling. And so I get asked, what can we do to manage these? Well, one of the things that we can recommend is delay planting because the adults emerge. If the plants aren't at the right stage when the adults are emerging, uh, they're going to pass them by. Another one, like I just mentioned, is lower planting populations. That can be very effective. Again, I'm kind of, it's in the recommendations from the past, so I'll throw it in here, fall tillage. Not saying that you should do it, but anytime we have pests uh, that are using the stock of the, the crop to overwinter, tillage can disrupt them, um, can kill them just directly by hitting them, or it can expose them to colder air because typically they're going to be right at the soil level. So if you can get them so that they're up in the air a little bit for cold, cold temperatures, cause some issues for them. The other thing is if you do have an infestation and you start to notice that uh, plants are starting to lodge a little bit from that girdling, harvest them. Uh, that's, that's kind of the best recommendation we can give. So these two typically say don't work the best. Delayed planting, you know, if you get a nice spring where the weather's perfect, go for it. Uh, but I don't have a crystal ball that I can predict what when we're getting rain and how long it's going to rain and when it's going to dry out. And so I, I always say, if the conditions are right and you're ready to plant, it's probably best to go and plant. Uh, one of the things that, you know, reading through some of these publications for a lot of these different insect pests says, is don't be the first or last person in your neighborhood to plant. Uh, and so maybe that would be a recommendation, wait for everybody else to get their sunflowers in and then put yours in because their fields will get targeted first. And I'm sorry if you're the neighbor in that situation, uh, but that is actually a recommendation uh, for people is make sure that yours aren't the target. Uh, let somebody else be. So uh, some other pests we do have in South Dakota, we've been hearing about a little bit more and seeing some evidence that they're out there. First is banded sunflower moth. They get their name because of this dark brown band on the wings of the adults. They're typically in the fields from June, July. The larvae feed up into the developing seed, and then they eat the seed, and then they uh, come back out. And I don't have a picture here, but the eggs are actually laid uh, on the bracts. And so if you see little white specks on the bracts when you're out scouting, there's a good chance that it's banned in sunflower moth. Now, this year we put some traps out. We're going to put more traps out next year, spread them out a little bit more. We're driving through looking at sunflower anyway, so we figured we should keep track of these populations. Another pest that we see, uh, we did the National Sunflower Survey this year. I didn't see as much of it as I have in the past is sunflower head moth. Uh, the caterpillars here are pretty small, but they have an orange head, black body with white lines, and they feed on developing seeds. They will actually feed through the head, which can open up the head to diseases. Uh, another thing they do is they spin a web and it'll catch, you know, as your head's drying down, start to lose the flowers. This webbing will catch that. Can If we get rain at the right time, you can get additional mold. Uh, one of the reasons we don't see these real consistently and at really large populations here in South Dakota is they have to migrate from the Southern US. Down there, they're much more of an issue. So. Uh, as long as we don't get good southerly winds to push them up at the right time, we shouldn't have huge issues from them, but they are out there. And then I think this is my last pest. And, uh, you know, if you were out in the fields last year, you know that they were a problem. Uh, grasshoppers have been an issue for the last few years. They've been spotty, but we're noticing the populations going up. And so, you know, in South Dakota, we have to talk about grasshoppers. So there are issues in 2020. We had a favorable fall in 2020. So the later our first hard frost, the more favorable it is. Those grasshoppers are laying more eggs. Now, if we'd go into the 2021 season, it was also really dry. And dry conditions are actually pretty favorable for grasshoppers because we have more bare patches. More bare patches mean better egg laying sites for the grasshoppers. So here's a picture from 2020. Now this was near the Dakota Lakes Research Farm. This was actually on the farm. Uh, this is one of our plots for sunflower. And you'll notice it looks like it got hit by hail or something. And I have to say that one week it looked okay and the next week it looked like this. If you notice even the soybeans are looking a little tough. Uh, well, what happened? 
but you can't see it really well. Maybe if some somebody has really good eyes, you can see it here. Grasshoppers, two strike grasshoppers showed up. And actually when we were out scouting, we were stopped at a sunflower field on Canyon Road. Uh, and then we were going down towards the farm, Dakota Lakes Research Farm. And we stopped and uh, neighbors stopped by and we were visiting and he goes, I'm sorry about your plots last year. And I said, what do you mean you're sorry about my plots? And he goes, uh, you know, I sprayed some grass. And the grasshoppers moved out of that into your, your stuff. And then they kept moving into the field. And so uh, it's just a good reminder, though, that they're there. Even when we don't notice them, uh, as soon as a food source runs out, they will move into our crops. Uh, and you can see there's a lot of them just on the head here. And I don't have the pictures, but the heads were gone in about another week. It was pretty much gone. Plots were a bust. But I, I thought it was a great reminder for how fast a grasshopper population can decimate a field. Incidentally, the field across from where we had our plots had to have the first, I'd say, 300 feet replanted this year because the grasshoppers were so bad again that they clear cut the sunflower at emergence and had to be sprayed. The center of the field looked okay because they caught the grasshoppers before they made it that far in, but then the edge was quite a bit behind and that was why. So let's look at our season for drought last in 2021. So starting in May, it was pretty dry. We weren't the only place it was dry. Montana was dry too, and things were tough there for grasshoppers. As a result, we had grasshoppers moving into the state from Montana. Uh, those happened to be the red-legged for the most part. But dry conditions mean grasshoppers are moving and they're looking for more food. The red here is extreme drought. As we go down, it's less drought. White means there was none. So in May, if you're up in this part of the state, things were tough. It still stayed tough, even though the drought monitors said it wasn't quite as bad. But I wanted to point out the drought wasn't just up here anymore. It was kind of moving around in the state. We weren't getting a lot of precipitation. Now in September, a few areas, and I, this area up here, uh, John Klein, John gave a talk, uh, would have been last week about how they had some really great corn yields up here. They had rain, timely rains, pretty much all season. Uh, typically, I say that Brookings County is pretty, pretty wet. It was pretty dry this year. Uh, I think if I would have dug in my backyard, I want to hit the water table this year until I maybe made it a few feet down. But, uh, you know, dry conditions, favorable for grasshoppers. Now, Phil and I were out in August, you know, doing our survey. So imagine we're driving here and going north. We saw a lot of fields going up here where we'd get out and it just looked like the ground was moving because there were so many grasshoppers. A lot of the areas we saw this in where if uh, grass had just been cut and baled, how uh, the grasshoppers were searching for food, but there's a good chance you're going to see some grasshopper populations as we move into 2022. And the reason for that is, is our first hard frost this year was about three weeks late for most of the state. There was one little area here where it was at the end of September. So that's kind of on par for where we'd expect it. But if we look here, a lot of the state didn't have its first hard frost till sometime in early to late October. And, you know, down in the southeast here, uh, south and southeast, you know, went to November. And so what that tells us is grasshoppers had a really long period for laying eggs. We'll probably see populations as we move forward. Now, today's about sunflower, but if you work with alfalfa, one of the things they always say is where we have grasshoppers, the next year we will have blister beetles. Blister beetles follow grasshopper population because the larvae feed on the eggs. So that's their food source. And so it happens. A lot of those fields where we are seeing a lot of grasshoppers, we were also seeing a lot of blister beetles uh, in those areas as well. So uh, something to watch out for, but that's not for today's talk. So my prediction, like I said, Due to the drought and the late frost, we're probably going to see some large populations for grasshoppers, uh, just something to really monitor for in the spring. So here's some additional information for you all. I know it was in the intro slides as well. I'm going to scroll up and make sure I don't miss anybody's questions. Uh, and then if you need to get a hold of me, here's my contact information. I see Cody. Uh, Cody, we actually tried a portable vacuum cleaner this year. And one of the issues we, we need to figure out how to make it so that we have a smaller uh, point of entry. 
uh, because we lot we weren't getting enough suction and those those weevils are typically down under the bracts uh, you know and once we flower they go down in between the developing seeds and so you need a lot of suction and so you know that little aspirator thing that that allows us to have some pretty pinpoint but you know we're we're willing to work on anything this way <laughs> because if we're looking at collecting i think this last year one day we collected 16,000 weevils uh and you know if we added up all the weevils we collected we were probably close to 100,000 and we'd love if we didn't have to aspirate those all uh, the same way as we did this year for next year uh and uh for Ruth uh, going through uh the level of infestation in North Dakota typically isn't as severe as we're seeing in South Dakota. So they are starting to see weevils because uh, they sent us some for one of our tests that we did this year and they have enough to test. They were able to put 20 in each vial. So they have them, but I definitely agree. Their numbers aren't as high as they here are here in South Dakota. Um, and then I think I already answered it about the bird seed. Uh, Cody, you had a question. Do I have any data for or theories on tank mixing the three actives I covered? Uh, so if you're talking about the pyrethroid active ingredients, uh, you know, tank mixing all three at this point, I think is too late and maybe would have never been a great solution because of the fact that they're all in the same class. So they're all pyrethroid. Ideally, when we tank mix, we're switching. So we're making a mixture of maybe a pyrethroid, organophosphate, neonicotinoid, anything we can get our hands on essentially. Uh, and so if we tank mix all the same class, that issue of cross resistance could still pop up. And so, you know, when you're tank mixing the, the cost there is, you know, additionally to the, uh, you know, the extra cost of the insecticide is, if your products already have any issues, you don't want to use them for a tank mix because you're just, you're paying money for something that probably isn't working. You're putting pressure on something that is working and you might think you're not putting all the pressure on it, but you are. Uh, the other issue is, is if everything does work, but you use the same tank mix over time and you have a lot of products in it, uh, one of the things we're always scared of is a super resistant population. Uh, and so tank mixes are something we generally will recommend, uh, but uh, you know there are some caveats with it, some things to consider. So. Uh, if you have more questions, throw them in. I'm going to let Shelby take over for a second here, and then I'll answer the rest of them. All right. Thank you so much, Adam. Let's see. All right, and while that is up, um, I did put a link in the chat um, about our upcoming winter roadshow uh, dates and information. Um, the upcoming event will be in Aberdeen on January 28th, so this Friday. Um, it'll be at the American Inn from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., so if you're interested, please check that out. Um, let's see, any more questions? Yeah, I see uh, Marv, uh, there are, Marv asks, are any beneficials that would control seed weevils? There have been some studies done and there are some, so little wasps, parasitoid wasps. And we actually got some uh, potential evidence this year. I had a call in the spring uh, about all of these wasps that were coming out of stored sunflower and concerns that they were feeding on that stored seed. And so I said that the weevils drop out of the seed in the fall, but in some instances they don't. If you harvest a little too early or maybe the, for whatever reason, the weevils are a little behind schedule and you harvest and they're still in the seed, uh, they'll stay in the seed in the bin. And I think all of those wasps that they were observing in that bin were probably actually parasitoids that were inside those larvae. The problem with those uh, predators is that they have to wait for the larvae to already be in the head, uh, in, in that developing seed, and then they target them. And so ideally we'd find something that would maybe target them when they are down in the soil. And as far as that, I don't know, uh, you know, 
we know that there are a lot of beetles, so ground beetles and other things that will feed on just about anything in, on or in the soil. But I don't know if there's a lot of uh, work that's been done or any evidence that they actually also feed on uh, red sunflower seed weevil larvae. Uh, let's see. So there are some, but uh, unfortunately, they won't stop these really large populations. Uh, they will stop you know, the next year in terms of we won't have as many adults potentially if you have a lot of the wasps out in the field. And uh, Ruth, yeah, they, you know, the planting timing, uh, there is some evidence in the literature that, uh, you know, if you can skip, skip or miss when the red sunflower seed weevils are emerging and searching out, uh, there's a chance that you can not have as much of an uh, impact from their populations. And that's something we might need to uh, kind of explore a little bit here in South Dakota. Actually, I think a lot of the data talks about planting later. Uh, I need to go back and double check that though, Ruth. Uh, I can reach out to you and then you can let uh, people know if you have anybody you want to talk to about that. But, uh, you know, one of the one of the big things though with that is, you know, you're, you're kind of trying to guess when the pest's emerging and uh, try not to have those coincide perfectly with the sunflower. So when we get to the reproductive stage, the red sunflower seed weevils are already, already passed and they moved to other areas or, uh, you know, aren't ready. And then Cody, you have a question here. Uh, do I have a prediction on which would be the most likely insecticide to get an emergency use label? At this time, I do not. Uh, however, there are a few potentials that I think we're going to work. Jan and I need to meet and have a conversation about them. And then uh, I think we'll be working probably with National Sunflower uh, and then uh, trying to get some of those sent to the states, uh, both North Dakota and South Dakota, to talk about the potential for their benefit and our need. So uh, if we do get that done, hopefully we'll get that done here yet this in the spring. So it's not something we're rushing for in the summer. But as soon as we get that, we'll put that in our newsletter. We'll put an article out and then probably also put it on the radio too. So we'll keep you informed as much as we can. Otherwise, if that looks like it might be the last question, Shelby, if anybody else has any, I think we're right at 11. Yeah. So I'll, otherwise, I'll turn it over to you, Shelby. All right. Thank you so much, Adam. And I think the only other um, announcement is we hope to see you here tomorrow. Um, we'll just be covering, it'll be the last day for sunflower and it will be over weed management and control. So hope to see you there and have a great day.